Look at the law of the pendulum. And here's the quote. It is necessary to learn to see everything with its two faces, positive and negative, and to not become identified with any one of them, because both are illusory. Everything passes, in life, everything passes. And we're really going to explore what that quote means today. And this is a, a, a rather interesting class. It has a lot of implications mm -hmm. and a lot that require reflecting on. Uh, what we're going to see through the course of today's lecture is we really define our own happiness and consequently our own unhappiness as well. And we're going to see that uh, a lot of the things that we experience are just things that we've created ourselves. Just we are obviously responsible for a lot of the illusion that we see before us because we create a lot of it. And um, I really enjoy this quote, you know, this two shall pass, everything passes. It's a good reminder when sometimes uh, you know, the world seems to be going against us or we find ourselves in the grip or the grasp of that, a negative state that in the end, it always ends, right? Everything always passes. The law of the pendulum is another one of these mechanical laws governing humanity. We've been learning a lot about different laws governing humanity, and the law of the pendulum is, is quite similar. Remembering that when we don't fully understand all the different laws, all the different influences working on us, that causes us to experience uh, a lot of negative situations. It's a cause of a lot of stress and frustration and that kind of stuff. When we don't quite understand all these different forces governing our existence. The law of the pendulum is another one of these laws that ends up complicating our lives. And not understanding this law, as I was hinting at earlier, causes a lot of suffering. And when we study the law, once we understand how it works, once we understand different forces that are coming into play, then we can navigate the ship of our life um, easier. One of the strange things about humanity is we constantly live in the battle of opposites. We're constantly stuck between two polarities trying to decide one side or the other. <coughs> and think of, you could do this for hours, happy, sad, hot, cold, pleasure, pain, optimistic, pessimistic, up, down, left, right, in, out, forwards, backwards, coming, going. That's what we do. Our brain is hardwired to do that. Our brain even has two different hemispheres, right, that are basically fighting for control over a lot of different aspects of our consciousness. And that's how we see it manifested. We see the battle of the opposites everywhere. You know, we've all experienced this before. You open the fridge because you're hungry, do you go with a chocolate cake, or do you go with a bag of potato chips, right? This constant battle that we have raging inside of us that we can't seem to escape. No matter what we do, you know, we think of one thing, there's an immediate opposite that's set up in our mind, and next thing you know, we're caught between those two things. Should I do this or should I do that? What if and but, all that kind of stuff. The times of well-being and times of upset appear in all aspects of our lives. Everything has its ups and downs. Whether it's our relationships, whether it's finances, whether it's our job, whether it's our mood, we constantly find ourselves swinging between one aspect or another, something we label as good and something we label as bad, something that's desirable, something that's undesirable, whether it's, you know, a good point in a relationship or a breakup, whether it's, you know, tight on money or, you know, flush with the finances, whether the job's going good, the job's going bad. I mean, that's such a common thing we say to people when we say them, you know, how's it going? How are you? How are you doing? You're basically asking for a measurement of where you are in this law right now. Are you in the good part and everything's going great or are you in the bad part and things not going so well? What we find, too, is periods of happiness are always followed by periods of pain. We can't seem to sustain this. This happiness is something that we're all seeking. Everybody wants to be happy all the time. But we can't seem to maintain this happiness. And when we're experiencing this, no matter how happy we are, we know that this isn't going to last forever. At some point, this is going to end and something else is going to happen. Okay, the interesting thing is, though, when we find ourselves in those periods of pain, we can always have hope because that, too, ends and is replaced by something else. But studying the law of the pendulum helps us understand why we can't maintain this happiness. Because what we're going to see with today's lecture is this is our fault. We're the ones that can't sustain that happiness. We're creating that situation where we can't have that peace and happiness that we're looking for because we're creating the happiness and unfortunately, we're also creating the pain as well. And neither of these are real. They're both illusory states of existence. <clears throat> One of the things we have to remember, and we've hinted at this many times in other lectures, equilibrium must be maintained. The nature, nature is all about maintaining a balance. That's just what nature does in work on the physical planet, governed by these very mechanical laws of nature. And equilibrium, or a balance, has to be maintained at all times. For every move in one direction, there must be an equal and opposite move in the other direction. 
And this is beautifully illustrated with the pendulum of a clock. I mentioned before I'm a little bit of a clock nut, right? Yeah. <laughs> and that's one of the reasons why. I have all these big old clocks everywhere and big grandfather clocks. And just to sit and watch the pendulum really reminds us of how this law works. You take a pendulum and you swing it two feet to the left. When you let go, it's going to go back and swing two feet to the right. That's what we're seeing um, illustrated with this example here. There's always going to be a balance. For every push in one direction, there must be an equal and opposite move in the other direction. And the implications of this that we're going to explore is we're always trying to push the pendulum, but only pushing it in one direction. Because we only want the swing over here. We don't want the swing over there. So what we're trying to expect the pendulum to do is just go to one side only, which doesn't work. The farther we push the pendulum to the right, so the farther we seek false pleasures with things like money and relationships and food or possessions or whatever, the farther we push it over here, what's going to happen? The farther it swings back the other way. By defining our own pleasures, we also create and define our own pain. The more we reach and, reach and strive to create these pleasures, the more we're creating our own pain and suffering as well. That's one of the things that the law of the pendulum is showing us, because we don't know how to live balance. We don't understand this balance. So we're constantly trying to push things in our favor, which is, in the end, defining our own sadness as well. The law of the pendulum governs everything. It happens on all kinds of different levels, from the daily lives of individuals to the rise and fall of countries and civilizations. You've heard the expression, what goes up must come down, right? It's the same thing not only for you know, gravity and something you throw in the air, but it's also the same thing for you know, the rise and fall of a country or an entire civilization or an entire race of humanity. We see this law happening on all kinds of different levels. It's not just day to day and our moods and experiences, but it's also our entire life plus the entire <coughs> existence of countries and civilizations as well. Another way of looking at that, the victorious <coughs> always fall, the defeated always rise up. Because in the end, both represent an imbalance, an unnatural state of existence. They don't know how to live in balance with all the different aspects of uh, the physical world. And we find ourselves in the same situation every day. We don't know how to live in balance. We don't know how to keep our psychology in balance. We don't know how to keep the energies of our body in balance. So we find ourselves swinging wildly from one side to the other. For every ascent, there must be a descent, right? What goes up, let's go down. The law of the pendulum manifests not only in our mind with our thoughts, as we were looking at earlier, you can think of, you know, hot, cold, in, out, up, down, that kind of thing. It also manifests in the five centers that we see. Um, in the mind, it manifests as the battle between the thesis and the antithesis, the two poles of any given situation. Um, and that's best represented in the situation of indecision. You've got this over here, or you've got that over there. This, that, this, that, as we swing back and forth between the two. In our emotional center, it manifests as a battle between opposite emotions. Happy, sad is the best example of this. So you've got these thoughts that are swinging from one pole to another. You've got emotions that are swinging from one pole to another. Well, right? We have times when we're happy and content and experiencing joy and happiness, but we also have times where we're experiencing things like, you know, anger or sadness and that kind of stuff. And even in the motor center, it manifests as times when we feel like doing a lot of physical activity, where we feel like we're accomplishing a lot, and then times where we don't want to get out of bed or even get off the couch, right? We see that happening in all the different centers of the body. As long as we're governed by this law, we can't possess individuality. We can't really have a true, definitive individuality, personality. We have no foundation on which to stand. Or like somebody on a swing set that's just caught between two people that are being pushed back and forth. We can't stay at any particular spot. As long as we're caught up in this law, we're never going to experience that inner peace, that lasting happiness, that contentment. We're just simply pushed from one side to another. And guess who's pushing the swing? Ego. Yeah. What we're going to see today, the ego uses this law to its advantage mm -hmm. because it knows that through driving this law, it can sustain its own existence. The egos can simply play, uh, or two or more egos can play us against each other, just like sitting on a swing mm -hmm. and the egos both pushing from either side, knowing the more they push, the higher we go. The higher we go, the more we go the other side, and it just, it's a perpetual cycle that seems to keep going and going and going. 
we find ourselves as well full of hypocrisy and contradiction because of this law. We've all done this before, right? Acted or thought a certain way, only later on to turn and go in the other direction. Some people are more prone to this than others. <coughs> Not everybody physically might manifest that, but in our mind we see a lot of that kind of stuff happening. We have to comprehend this law and learn to recognize its actions in others as well. Because not, not only is it governing our existence, it's also governing the existence of everyone around us, everybody that we're involved with in the various relationships we have, be it a significant other, um, a family member, a friend, a co-worker, or something like that. Uh, and it's the same way, just like when we understand and recognize the ego within ourselves, then we learn to forgive the manifestations of the ego in others, right? That's how we accomplish that whole do unto others as you have them do unto you sort of thing. Because when you really study the manifestation of ego in yourself, then you learn to understand and work with that manifestation in other people and not simply react to it. The same thing happens with this law. Once we really understand how this law works, we can observe its action in other people and use that uh, in our advantage in relationships to prevent things like conflict, to prevent manifestation of ego and that sort of thing. For example, when someone is angry at us, we have to recognize that they're exhibiting one swing of the pendulum, soon the other side will manifest. Okay, and that's not what we want to do when people are angry at us. We want to meet that anger head on, right? We want to give it a good shove back the other way. And then we get caught up in this whole situation. With the law of the pendulum, once you can understand that if your significant other is, you know, experiencing anger towards you for whatever situation, that it's, it's just fleeting. It's illusory. Why identify with it? Why get caught up in it? Just, you know, let the, leave the person alone and eventually we know a different side will manifest. <coughs> Okay, but that's not the impulse that we have. That we feel that anger as a physical push, and we want to respond with a push back. Next thing you know, you're in some sort of a, an altercation, some sort of a fight, where you're basically acting like those two people either side of the swing, just batting it back and forth. Between left, right, between up, down, etc., etc., there's always a point which is very short in duration that is neither one extreme nor the other. And this is a meditation I really enjoy, just staring at this big brass pendulum, is between those two extremes, there's a point of perfect balance. There's a point that is neither left nor right, but exactly in the middle. The only problem with that point is it's very short in duration. It's a split second on, the tr on that pendulum travel. So consequently, we don't really understand this point. We miss this point, we don't know how to be at that point, we don't know how to maintain that balance. We're caught on that swing going from one side to the other, we miss that point of balance. What we want to do is, imagine you're swinging on that swing, you want to jump off right at that point of balance and remain standing on a solid foundation. And then you're watching the swing go, but you're no longer part of the swing. You've managed to find a different point, you've managed to find a point of balance and not let the swing take you for a ride. So many people are caught on that swing and they go wherever the swing goes, which is wherever the ego directs them. So they're constantly craving that happiness, that sadness, or they're constantly, sorry, constantly craving that happiness, that pleasure, all these things that they're reaching for over here, and then they find themselves even further on the other direction once the pendulum swings the other way. What we want to do is jump off. We don't want to ride the pendulum. We can observe the pendulum, we can see that there's happiness over here, we can see that there's sadness over there, but we don't have to participate in those. Okay, so imagine sitting, riding the pendulum, grabbing onto it, just going wherever it goes. We have no will, we just go where the pendulum takes us. But imagine jumping off at that point right in the middle, which would be the safest place to jump off if you were on a swing, because it would be the point closest to the ground, right? And imagine we jump off at that point, and now we've discovered that we're away from the pendulum. We can observe the pendulum fully, we can see what it's trying to do, but we're at a different vantage point. That's what we're striving to do, and we're going to look at some techniques for doing that today. But in the back of our mind the whole time, that's what we're going to think of. You want to get off the pendulum. You want to be in that point of balance. That point that is neither left nor right, but is directly in between. Okay? You can think of that as the exact center between two poles. It's sometimes called the center path, the point of balance, and it's often referred to as the synthesis as well. 
That's why even we talk about gnosis. We call it the path of the razor's edge. And we say it's, you know, we call it the path of the razor's edge because imagine trying to walk down a razor. Barely, it's so narrow, it's so thin, it's so easy to fall left or fall right. This is the same analogy. That exact point of balance is an extremely thin line between two poles. It's a point of very short duration, which is uh, a challenge to, to uh, arrive at, okay, the exact center. We have to learn to live outside the pendulum. We have to learn how to jump off that pendulum and avoid the extremes by walking the center path. We have to get out of that whole mindset of being caught up in this process. And that's one of the things that we're going to look at today is like, how do we do that? Because if we don't do that, we just find ourselves once again the victim of circumstances. We go where the pendulum takes us. That pendulum being pushed by our own ego, or many times that pendulum being pushed by the ego of other people around us, our environment and all that kind of stuff that's sustaining that swing from one side to another. We find ourselves dragged along for the ride. We have to learn to get outside of that law, to avoid the extremes, to find that point of balance and stay there as long as we can, as often as we can. We have to learn, and this is the whole key, to not take part in the swing between extremes by not identifying with either pole, the positive aspect or the negative aspect of anything. Because that's what we do. Whenever we take a situation, we break it down into a pro and a con, a good and a bad, right? That's what we do. We take things and we split them apart. We have this dichotomy that we do, and then we only identify with one side of it. So you take a given situation, you say, this is the situation, but I only want to do this. I don't want to do the opposite. So there's always something that's desirable and something that's undesirable. So by doing that, we've set up the pendulum and we've started the swing. And now we find ourselves caught between those two points. And that's what the ego uses to sustain itself. That constant swing between the positive and negative is basically the source of the energy that the ego uses to exist. Whether it's between emotions, expending emotional energy, whether it's between thoughts, expending intellectual or mental energy, whether it's between actions, expending motor energy. This is what we're doing that allows the ego to take advantage of this law in order to sustain itself. The middle path, the center of the circle, was the Tao of China. If you've heard of that aspect before, that's what they're talking about. Okay, the Tao, that point exactly in between the two, was sometimes seen as the center of the circle. Um, to think of a circle analogy, let's imagine instead of being on a pendulum, you're on a carousel, a horse carousel. And all those different horses represent the various thoughts or the various egos that you have. Now when you're sitting on the carousel, you're sitting on, let's say it's the white horse, and you're going where the carousel takes you. You're on a loop just going around and around the same track over and over again. That loop, that track, represents the mechanical laws governing our existence. We just go round and round doing the same things over and over again, return and recurrence. The horse that we're sitting on at any given time represents whatever ego that's manifesting. Okay, so we're caught and we go wherever the horse takes us and we see whatever direction the horse is pointing in. That's the perspective we have of the world. What we want to do, imagine being on that carousel but jumping off and standing right in the middle. And instead of revolving around on that carousel, that carousel instead revolves around us. And we're able to see all the different thoughts, all the different egos that come into play, but we don't identify with any one of them. They simply come into our field of view and drift away without us identifying. Okay, which is the same idea as I mentioned before. Our thoughts should be like cars on the road that just simply drive by without affecting us. Or clouds in the sky, they simply drift by without involving us, without us identifying with them. I want to jump off that carousel and step to a different point where everything in life happens outside of us that we don't identify with it. And that was the concept of the Tao. Um, you've, same thing, you've heard the concept, you know, be in the now, be in the moment. It's the same thing. Because to be in the present moment is to be in that thin point. It's to be at that point of balance where you're caught up neither in the past nor the future, but a perfect point of balance right here in the now. It's a very short point. It's really short in duration and difficult to maintain, but it's there. <clears throat> so here's the quote. That person really realizes that all... This is a sorry translation. That person really realizes that all in the life has two faces, but unfortunately they do not place themselves in the center of the circle in the Tao. When one is in the Tao, one knows that one sees everything pass around oneself, around one's own consciousness. 
all the events of life with their two faces, and one knows that they're temporary. Okay, so when we're caught up on that horse, we're just, you know, going around on that carousel. When we're sitting on the pendulum, that's all we see is where the pendulum is going. If we jump off that pendulum or jump off that carousel, we can see, you know what? That was just a temporary point, and that's just a temporary point. These are both temporary, and where I am is somewhere different, somewhere separate from those fleeting temporary moments. A place where I'm standing of my own will and I'm directing my path and choosing where I want to go. I'm not caught up on where that pendulum is. I'm not caught up on going round and round in circles and not on that merry-go-round, that carousel. I am at a different point. Okay? And that was the doubt. That's what we mean by the events of life with the two faces, just seeing the pendulum swing that way or seeing the pendulum swing this way. From that different vantage point, that, that point of balance, you're able to hold both in your hand at the same time. And what we'll see when we do with what we can see, sorry, when we're able to do that, is we can reconcile the opposites, which is another important technique. It's only through that center path, that point of balance, the Tao, the center of the circle, where we can achieve the synthesis of the opposites, where we can reconcile the opposites. Okay, because we've got the thesis, the antithesis, the two opposing <coughs> forces that are reconciled and balanced with the synthesis. Just like you've got the positive and the negative that are reconciled and balanced in the neutral. Okay, and that's what we're trying to do with this. It's only from that vantage point that you're able to do that. Fully comprehend both the positive aspect and the negative aspect. View both of them simultaneously and reach a psychological vantage point where we're able to reconcile the two. We're able to realize that both are fleeting. Both are illusory, so why get caught up with either? Why get caught up with false happiness is just as crazy as getting caught up with all the sadness. We really don't need to go either of those paths because we've chosen a different path. We're at a different point. When we're on the pendulum, all we know is that false happiness and that false sadness. And we just go wherever the pendulum takes us. We don't know what it's like to experience a different state the Tao. So Lee, uh, if you do find your center point and, and you don't get caught up with that, mm -hmm. and you don't really uh, feel that illusory uh, happiness, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's, but, but it's not real, it's fleeting, <coughs> and you don't, but then again, you don't feel the sadness that comes with it as well, right? Because yeah. they're, they're part, a yeah, package of the same thing. Exactly. Flip side of the same coin. Mm -hmm. If you get one, you're going to get the other. Yep. So if you, if you, so it's like stepping back or, or Yeah, what? kind of. And then there's sometimes a real risk that's saying, well, you know, not going with a sadness and not going with a happiness. Geez, that sounds like a really boring existence that's like totally flat line. Mm -hmm. But that's not the case because when you're not caught up in that happiness and that sadness, so they're fleeting, they're illusory, you're at a different point, you're at a balance point. Mm -hmm. And that's where you get the peace and the calm and the contentment. And the contentment all that kind of stuff. Yeah, because, you know, um, like, I remember you saying that um, if, say, oh, if I make a lot of money, then I'll be happy. So then you're uh, uh, putting uh, limits on your happiness. Yeah, you put limits so on your happiness. Other, but we all know this, too, if we say, oh, if I made more money, I'd be happier. Well, if we did make more money, we'd have a different goal. That suddenly would we just push the pendulum even further. We yeah. this all the time. This is more. the goal I must reach. And then you reach it. And you just push that bar further and further to give you something else to strive for. We never reach that balance point. And think of like being waves in the ocean. You could say that when the wave comes up, that's like the, you know, the positive aspect. When the wave drops down, that's the negative aspect. We find ourselves in constant turmoil bobbing up and down. The balance point would be like a clear, flat lake yeah. where there's no waves. We're just at peace. We're balanced. We're perfectly floating in the water in a perfectly happy state. It's not the ups and downs of those two opposing forces. Because waves don't just go up, they go up, but then they drop down as well, right? And we find ourselves yeah. being caught in those hills and those valleys. Do you find that we're addicted to that, to that up and down? Uh, not so much addicted, it's hardwired to do that. And that's, that's why we're the obsessed. egos are there. We're obsessed with it, yeah. yeah. We've all experienced this, that idea of set a goal. I, I need this in order to be happy, or this in order to be content. Yeah. And then sometimes, even years later, you look back and you go, Oh, geez, I remember when I thought that's all I needed to be happy, and I reached that goal years ago, and I'm, I'm, still, different. Not yeah, I'm yeah. still not different. Why is that? It's because we just keep pushing that bar farther and farther and farther, and we can never quite reach it. And the farther we push that bar to define our happiness, 
the farther we push that bar to create our sadness as well. We just keep pushing things from one extreme to the other and find ourselves caught up in that. We have to learn to live at the center of that circle and watch the pendulum swing around us to not identify with either of them. And that's hard for us to do because psychologically your brain always goes, well, I don't want to not be happy. Like, what are you saying with this? Like, never experience any kind of happiness again? But that's not the case. Uh, and that's the real mistake to make when learning about this kind of stuff is you literally, until you start experiencing glimpses of this, you can't imagine what it's like. It's a different state of happiness. It's a different state of peace and contentment when, you know, this giant weight gets lifted off your shoulders. And until you've experienced that, it's hard to imagine what that's like. But it's different from the false happiness that we experience, the false happiness that relies on something external. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem with the happiness that we experience in life. It relies on a complicated set of equations. I'm only happy <coughs> if certain people are around, certain <coughs> events are transpiring, certain financial situations are occurring, I'm in a certain place, I have access to certain things. These are things that make us happy. I'm only happy, I'm only happy in the summer when it's a clear blue sky mm -hmm. and the weather's warm and I'm up at the cottage and I've got a beer in my hand. We, you set these... Oh yeah, sounds good. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> um, you, you set these equations up. Which also means, by the way, anytime I'm not doing that, I can't achieve that happiness. That's right. Right? The problem is the happiness that we experience so often is external. All these things have to happen before I can experience happiness. My happiness is only a result of A plus B plus C plus D. Mm -hmm. The kind of happiness I'm talking about, when we're able to break that pattern, is a happiness that comes from within. You could be anywhere without anything and still experience that. And I think that's where the Buddhists were coming from when they were talking about you know, getting rid of all your possessions and basically having nothing, the idea being that then you could find that happiness, a way to help do that. Think of people like Gandhi that were perfectly content sitting in a prison with nothing. They're, I, that's fine, I'm in a prison, I'm, I'm content, you're not changing my happiness, you're not taking it away, because they were able to arrive at a different point where their happiness wasn't external, it was internal. And that's the biggest difference between riding that pendulum and jumping off and maintaining that balance point. At that balance point, the happiness is generated internally and doesn't rely on external circumstances, people, possessions, things, money, other situations that have to arise. And if you think of your own life, we do that. Mm -hmm. right? Think of oh, all, yeah. all the times I'm happy. I have to have these things occur, and I strive to, to do these things, to be around people, to... You know, some people go so far as the happiness is a chemical happiness, so they need whatever, alcohol or drugs or something in order to maintain that. And that concept of the swinging pendulum is known to addicts, because addicts find themselves having to do drugs more and more often in greater and greater doses yeah. to achieve the effect that they're looking for, because they too are pushing that pendulum farther and farther away. We have to see... <coughs> events and situations of life revolving around us rather than participating directly in them. And that takes a lot of practice. Self-observation really helps to grasp that because self-observation, we kind of detach ourselves from the events in order to study them. Remember to properly do self-observation. It's the observer and the observed. You create that split. We're talking about something similar here as well. The idea that rather than simply participating in the events of life, treat it almost like a movie where we pull ourselves out of the situation because when we're in it we're caught up we're reacting when we can get that balance point we're in a different perspective we're still aware of the situation we're not ignoring it i'm not saying that we just completely disregarded it ignore it we're not ignoring it we're dealing with it but we're dealing with it from a different vantage point our consciousness is at a different level it's not caught up in the scene and being fueled by the ego it's aware of what's going on, but it, the consciousness remains active, which means you're a lot better uh, as far as judgment is concerned, as far as assessment to the situation, and as far as whatever action you're taking, because the action at that point is directed by the consciousness, it's not directed by the ego. Whereas if you're caught up in a situation, it's the ego doing the talking, doing the thinking, doing the feeling, right? But if we can get off of that pendulum, we can find that point of balance, then it's the consciousness that's assessing the situation, that's responding to the situation, and that's deciding the course of action. Instead of riding the pendulum, swinging from side to side, we have to watch it swing without following it. 
So we have to be aware that these are the emotions I'm experiencing, these are the thoughts that I'm experiencing, but they're fleeting. They're, they're going to happen. Until we completely eliminate the ego 100%, we're still going to have the thoughts and the emotions and that kind of stuff. We're still going to be feeling those impulses. But rather than letting those impulses take us, we're aware of them, we're aware of the anger or the sadness or their happiness, but we're not identifying with it. We're not getting caught up with that. <clears throat> if we could see the two faces of things, everything would be different, but we lack comprehension. If we want to see the two faces of everything, it is necessary not to live inside of the law of the pendulum, but within a closed circle, within a magical circle. So imagine, I like to think of it, this is kind of a strange thing to explain, but I like to think of like inverting the world, where instead of I'm in the world, imagine I'm in the center of the circle and the world kind of revolves around me. So imagine that you're in this room, but imagine this room folds inside out and everything on this room appears on the outside as separate from you. Whatever mental trick you want to imagine that working for yourself, that's the way you think of it. You're in that circle, or you're the carousel. You're standing in the middle, and all the events of your life are the carousel passing before you. The good <coughs> things, the bad things, everything flows around you. It is not part of you. You are not part of it. It is separate and distant from you. You're still aware of it. You're still acting in the situation. You're still participating, but at a different vantage point. Imagine you're participating more like the director in a movie instead of one of the actors that are caught up in the scene. You have a different perspective, you're able to see the situation from a different vantage point. Okay, uh, That's how we learn to understand the two faces of everything. That's how we learn to see that the happiness is just another side of the coin, as you put it earlier, of the sadness. They're the same thing. But imagine if you know, you're dealing with a coin, like a coin, a coin, you've got heads and tails, right? But imagine you are the head. When you're the head, you, you can't see the tail. When you're the tail, you can't see the head. But to somebody holding the coin, you can see both simultaneously and realize it's all just the same thing. The head and the tail are just two sides of the exact same coin. And this, is a, this is something that's separate from me, right? But that's the thing. When you're on the tail, that, that's all you can see. That's all you know. And when you're on the heads, that's all you know. From this vantage point, you're able to see both sides of everything. And we're going to see that that's how you arrive at the synthesis. And by arriving at the synthesis, you basically negate the effect of the thought. Okay? Think of somebody pushing you on the swing with a certain amount of force, but somebody pushing from the other side with the equal amount of force. You're going nowhere. You're sitting at the middle. This is what we're trying to do. Let us imagine a circle around us, a magical circle. Around that circle are passing all the opposite pairs of philosophy the thesis and the antithesis, the agreeable and the disagreeable circumstances, the periods of success and the periods of failure, the optimism and pessimism, basically what you call good and bad, positive and negative. Around that, excuse me, around that magical circle, we can see a very interesting parade. We discover that after every great joy, there comes depressive anguish and painful states. In other words, we start to discover a pattern. We start to discover a degree or level of mechanicity. And that's the key to understanding this, is being able to experience for yourself that everything happens in these waves or these ripples, which is what this law is all about. And discover that really my thoughts, my emotions, my experiences, they're mechanical. They follow this like preset re uh, repetition of patterns, depending on whether we're talking about thoughts, emotions, and that kind of stuff. Okay, that's what he means by this interesting parade, is seeing these things constantly affecting us. Because... Our emotions, our thoughts, there's a pattern to them. There's a degree of mechanicity to them. Our lives are very routine. We are creatures of habit. And when we divorce ourselves from that, we're able to see the habits. Just like if we spend a lot of time with somebody, like our significant other, we know all the habits that they have, right? Because we observe them firsthand. We're aware of more of their habits than they probably are. We're aware of more of their little routines and nuances than they're probably even aware of. We need to do that with ourselves to become at a different vantage point, a different level of awareness. Obviously, one then does not identify with one face or the other. If we can just see it's a constant... Uh, transition from one to the other, we can not get caught up in that. We're able at that point to reconcile the opposites through the synthesis. We're able to both hold both in our hand at the same time. We're able to both hold or be aware of both states of consciousness simultaneously, both states of existence simultaneously. Okay, uh, let's take for example somebody that's at a party having a good time. However, 
so you're at a party, you're having a good time. However, you're you're trying to self-observe. You're trying to stay in the present moment. You're trying to find that that point of balance, the, the Tao. That person knows that after any moment of happiness, there's a chance of that happiness ending, which brings with it pain, which brings with it unhappiness for whatever reason. If that person is located in the center, in the Tao, then they reconcile the opposites within themselves, within their own being, within their own consciousness. They're able to say that after every joyful moment, there comes a sad one, but none of this affects me, because everything is passing, temporary, fleeting, illusory. People pass, things pass, ideas pass, everything passes. So I can live this event as it needs to be lived. And that's the key. It's not that you're sitting at the party going, this is boring. This is happiness, sadness. I can't wait to go home. <laughs> you're in a different state. You're being in the now. You're being in the present moment. Living that moment exactly how it needs to be lived. With perfect peace, perfect contentment, perfect happiness. Happiness that didn't depend on a certain number of people being there, or didn't depend on the right combination of alcohol and whatever, right? It's something that comes from within inside yourself. Being aware of those two states of existence. There's having a good time, and there's a bad time. I'm having a good time because it's a party, but the party will end. It has to end. Therefore, that happiness, which I have identified with, has to end when the party ends. But if we divorce ourselves from that and say that this is just one state of existence, when that ends is another state of existence, I don't have to be involved in either of those. I can stay here in the present moment, living my life as it needs to be lived right now. Experiencing this party how it needs to be experienced. Learning from it what I need to learn from it without getting caught up between those two extremes. <clears throat> A reflection like that will allow that person to stay at the event without any concern. They're conscious. They know that it's a passing moment. They don't elude it or escape from it. They simply understand it. They comprehend it. They live consciously. So in that situation of the party, somebody who's able to keep that frame of mind will be existing consciously, will be living in that moment consciously at that party. It's not that they can be there. It's not that they don't like it. It's not that they really like it. It's just they're aware of what's going on. They're living consciously, which means they're activating their consciousness and they're not identifying with their ego. When we live outside the pendulum, we can comprehend the law and recognize that because of that, everything passes, both the positive and the negative. They're both equally as temporary, they're both equally as fleeting, they're both equally as illusory. The only mistake we've made is when, I don't like that, but I really like this. I want a whole lot of that, but I want none of this, which is impossible to maintain. As I hinted at earlier, that's a, a pendulum that just swings like that. It's impossible to have that state. So we are setting up for ourselves a situation that is absolutely impossible to achieve. And then somehow expecting that we can live our life according to that. And that in itself is a cause of a lot of suffering. Because we can't always stay here. And it's relative. As I mentioned earlier, it doesn't matter how much money we have. They've done this, all kinds of psychological studies where they analyze, you know, people that are poor and people that are incredibly wealthy, and the problems are relative. You know, having infinite money doesn't bring with you infinite happiness. Somebody who has, you know, a hundred million dollars has the same problems that you have if you're absolutely broke. It's all relative. It all has to do with our psychology, and that's why they say money really can't buy you happiness, right? And it's funny because um, I read this, this interesting psychological study where they did all kinds of, of testing. And uh, you know how you're at your job and you're not appreciated enough? You know how your job you're not paid enough? Well, if you were paid $500 million a year, you still think you're underpaid. You still think you're underappreciated. You still look at your coworkers who might be making more money than you and compare yourself to other businesses and say, well, yeah, I make $500 million, but I only have three houses and one jet, but that guy that works at that company, he just bought a first ha fourth house and he has two jets. That is not fair. I am way worth way more than this. It's just relative. Just push that bar farther and farther and farther and farther ahead. You don't think you would. <laughs> you don't think you would, but they've done tons of tests to prove that's exactly what you do. And that's how come people end up with these exorbitant salaries of millions of dollars. They still feel underappreciated and undervalued. <laughs> That's what we saw something happen with the recent economic downturn, right? When they bailed out all those companies. And what did the CEOs do with the money? Most of the money went into bonuses for themselves. Because they were, this is the money that's going <coughs> to me. It's about time they paid up for what I'm worth. Right? And then there's the guy that's sweeping the floor going, 
Well, I'm worth more money too. I mean, it's just, that's their psychology. It's this. We just push that bar farther and farther and farther. And we're, we're not able to recognize this. And this is a key. We make the error in our lives of only wanting to cooperate with one side of the pendulum swing. That's all I want to do. I want to go right. I don't want to go left. I don't want to stay right as long as I can. And we really don't want the pendulum to do this. We want the pendulum to do that. And like, just stay there. <laughs> Which is even crazier than the concept of doing this. At least this has still got some movement to it, right? But we don't even want to go from neutral to positive. We want the pendulum to swing up and then never ever come back down again. Which is crazy. <laughs> right? But that's what every single person on the planet is trying to do. Is trying to live that impossible existence. To stay in a state that is completely unnatural and unbalanced. And it's impossible to achieve. Because it's such an imbalance, it's such an extreme. We only want to see one side of things. That's all we do. We always want to be happy. We are therefore sad when we're not. We, by creating our happiness, create our sadness. By saying these are the things that make me happy, you just identified automatically everything that makes you unhappy. By saying that I'm happy when I'm at the cottage with a beer in my hand on a nice sunny day when it's really warm, I have now just said, if I'm not doing that, I'm unhappy. And unfortunately, as far as what I have in time-wise, I don't get very many opportunities to do that. Therefore, apparently, I'm going to be unhappy most of the time. And that's what we do all the time. We create these things that say, this is what happiness means to me. And we identify them, we label them, we strive for them, we try to create them. But because we've identified our happiness, we've also created and identified our sadness as well. So we're the ones pushing the pendulum. It's the ego inside us. Yeah. So if you're really, really happy about something, you're supposed to say to yourself, oh, okay, this is just a thing that's going to pass. That's the yeah, I'm really happy, but this is just an illusion. Why am I happy? Well, because yeah. X, Y, and Z. Well, when that stops, that means I'm going to be sad. And if I'm going to be sad, and if I'm happy right now, uh, by creating this, I've created that, and they're both temporary. They're both illusory. They're both, why does my happiness depend on that? Why does my sadness <coughs> depend on this? Um, I'll ask it later. Okay. <laughs> Which be good, eh? <laughs> it's a good one. There are always two sides. If we're only happy on one side, then automatically we're unhappy if we turn it down. Right? It's just one of those things. By creating the one, we've created the other. By identifying this, we've created the other side. And we can't live with that pendulum that swings and goes infinitely high and then never comes back down again. And that's what we're trying to achieve, and that's obviously unbalanced. Think of it this way, the louder one laughs, the louder one cries, right? We've all heard similar expressions before. That's the reason why things like that are true. Because by, you know, identifying the things that create the laughs, we've identified the things that create the, the crying as well. And when we're not doing this, we therefore must be doing that, or we're caught up in some state of transition between those two extremes. The farther we push the pendulum to one side, the farther it swings back the other way. We always have to remember that. The more we strive to be happier and happier and push that bar higher and higher and higher, then the further we're swinging it the other way as well. Equilibrium must be maintained. If our ego is constantly pushing the pendulum to further extremes in only one direction, the farther nature pushes it back the other way to correct the imbalance. And that's why they say want and desire is the source of all suffering. I've got the whole Buddhist idea, right, that it's the want that's source of all suffering. And you say, well, it's not for own to want things and that kind of stuff. But when you look at it from context, the want and desire is the source of all suffering because that's you reaching over here, which means nature swings it back the other way to keep that balance, to keep that equilibrium. So that constant want and desire is defining all the negative situations in our life as well. So this is something that we do. We create this. We have to comprehend both sides to everything. And we have to stop identifying with only one side. We have to stop only wanting to push that pendulum in one direction. As I mentioned earlier, really, we want to find that path of balance and not be involved with that swinging. But when something good happens, we identify. We say, I like this, I enjoy this, I want it to continue, I want to stay here, and we become happy. When something bad happens, we identify with it, and now we're sad. We're basically identifying with both sides of that pendulum. We're constantly finding ourselves clinging from one side to the other. Both situations are unstable and not balanced and therefore there's going to be a shift to correct. 
they're not, neither of these are permanent, right? Everything passes, everything's a transition in life. No matter how much we want this, no matter how much we don't want that, they're both mm -hmm. states of imbalanced existence. When we become used to seeing things from outside the pendulum, when we're at that, that Tao, when we're at that different vantage point from the center of the circle, everything changes and we learn how to free ourselves from this law. We learn how to break free from that type of existence. We always have to acknowledge both sides. We never want to do that. We just want to pick one and, and run with that. We only want to favor one side. Instead, we have to acknowledge both exist. We have to look at happiness and sadness as two sides of the same coin. Not that I really want to be here and I really don't want to be there, but they're just both illusory. They both have the same weight or the same value or the same effect. And once we're able to arrive at that point, then we're not identifying. Then these things can happen, these situations can happen, and we don't have control over the ego. So rather than being in that party, getting caught up with the ego and drinking too much or doing something silly, or rather than being caught in that negative situation and getting upset and depressed, we can just look at them as two sides of the same coin and choose not to identify with those egos, to not fuel that swing even further. Remembering happiness and sadness is just two sides of the same thing. Both are, both are tr transitional, both are illusion, both are fleeting. The foundation of the ego is the dualism of the mind. The ego knows this law, it takes advantage of it. The ego is the one laughing, pushing us on the swing. Because it knows that we do this, and we will continue to do this. And while we continue to do this, that swing gains more and more energy and swings further and further and further, which is just sustaining all these egos and allowing them to manifest and exist through us. Okay, they're basically using that to, to their advantage. The dualism, the dualism of the mind is how the ego sustains itself. Because it's literally two egos fighting. You open the fridge door, do you want the chocolate cake or do you want the potato chips? There's two egos right there. And as you debate back and forth, you're sustaining those egos. You're feeding them. Okay, it's a silly example, but <laughs> satisfy both of them. I will give it to both. I'm going to put the potato chips on the chocolate cake and I'm going to eat it. Yeah. There you go. Problem solved. So that's the worst thing. <laughs> the ego is sustained by the battle of opposites. And this is raging on in our thoughts, in our emotions, in our actions from day to day. And that's, the ego is sustained by that battle. Is that battle's always there? Is that pendulum's always swinging? It's the one that's feeding off of that, and it's the one that's getting all the uh, sustenance. Yeah? Well, shouldn't people then have equal um, time, you know, being in sadness and <coughs> happiness? Because some people, we were talk. I was talking about that with my girlfriend, like some people are really, you know, drag you down. They're always negative, always sad. Some they, people have this happening on different levels. We all know people that can have this pendulum swinging like this all day. We call them bipolar, right? Yeah. Some people have this manifest on a much slower time period where maybe it's months to go one swing to the other. Some people it might be years to go on one swing to the other. Yeah, years. Maybe that, they that, never, that never forces, go back. It yeah. just seems like they can never get back. That force is always there. Yeah. No, yeah, maybe so. it's just you. Did you ever think that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe they just don't like you. <laughs> uh, sometimes, too, people um, that act like... You've heard the expression, some people aren't happy unless they're sad. There's some truth to that as well. Some mm -hmm. people aren't comfortable and aren't content and aren't enjoying themselves unless they're being absolutely miserable and treating everyone around them horribly. Right? It's just part of that, part of that manifestation. There is always a battle raging inside of us. This is the classic depiction of good and evil fighting for control. Legions of, angel, legions of angels and legions of demons fight with each other in all corners of the universe. It's between positive and negative. It's this flow of energy between the positive and the negative that brings about all of creation. This is what's driving the fuel, or it's the engine that's driving nature, all the energy in nature. This constant flow of energy from <coughs> positive to negative. This constant movement from one side to the other, which drives the whole machine of nature. Just like it's the movement of positive and negative in that electrical plug that's driving that machine of the projector. It's the same thing. And we get caught up in this big mechanical machine of nature, and we get caught up in this energy as well. The problems, I love this quote, the problems of life are nothing but mental forms with two poles, positive and negative. The problems in life are nothing but mental forms created and sustained by the mind. 
and that's something to really reflect on. That one took me it took me years to grasp the full meaning of that, and I really love that quote. The problems of life are nothing but mental forms created and sustained by the mind. And many times in life, when we stop identifying with the problem, it ceases to be. It's only a problem because we're making it a problem and we're feeding it as a problem. The problems that we experience are nothing but mental forms. These are things that we've created that have two poles, either a positive aspect or a negative aspect. Okay, the problems are created and sustained by our own mind. We're responsible for our own unhappiness, our own suffering, whatever that ends up being. When we stop thinking about the problem, when we stop pushing that pendulum, when we stop swinging, then the problem inevitably ends and we're able to arrive at a solution, at a way out, at a different perspective, at a different vantage point. Okay, the problems that we find as we worry and stress and think about them, that's just energy that goes into that pendulum swing. So the farther and farther it goes. When we jump off, find that point of balance, when we stop identifying, stop thinking and feeding all that energy to the problem, then the problem inevitably ends. Then we're able to see a different situation, a different outcome, a solution, that kind of stuff. We can free ourselves from the battle of opposites by learning to live in the instant. Not caught up in the daydreams and the fantasies. Not caught up in the memories and not caught up in the plans about the future. And we spend so little time living in the instant, right? That's the, you know, the big irony of being a, a human is in the end we miss our entire life because we're never there for it. We're either trying to relive it after it's done or trying to plan it before it happens. We're never actually there for it. So we never really experience much of our existence. It's one of these strange paradoxes to be human. That's key to understanding this, okay? Freeing ourselves in the battle of opposites by learning to be in the Tao. You know, be in the now is the, the buzzwords for, for uh, would be live in the present moment, what I like to call the eternal instant. It's always there, it never goes, but it's a really hard thing to find. It's such a small thing to grab onto. It's such a small, tiny slice to try to get to. It's like walking on that razor. It's just a really hard thing to balance on, but it's there and it can support us. We just have to get to that point. That's learning to live in the instant. Not caught up in the dreams and the fantasies. Not dragged into the past or dragged into the future, but to be there in the present moment. When we obtain the Philosopher's Stone by means of conscious work and voluntary suffering, then we obtain the reconciliation of the opposites within us. One recognizes all of creation has two faces. Okay, There's the positive and there's the negative, the thesis and the antithesis that are reconciled in the synthesis. Okay, If you take two steps forward and then take two steps backwards, you've gone nowhere. Okay, You've been able to stay at that point of balance. Acknowledging the positive is like taking two steps forward. Acknowledging the negative is like taking those two steps backward. Net result, you've stayed in the present moment. You haven't moved. You haven't fed the ego. You've stayed with the consciousness active. Yes? What is the uh, voluntary suffering referring to? The voluntary suffering is the, um, like the, the work that we're trying to do. The, the difficulties, the, the practice is required to, to self-observe. The willpower it takes to do this. That's voluntary suffering. But doesn't that polarize it as a negative thing, though? Uh, not really, no. Because it requires effort. Remember that when we look at things, the path of least resistance is to live life as you're living it right now. That's what most of human humanity does. They follow the path of least resistance. It is hard work to find that point of balance. That's what we mean by voluntarily suffering. So the path of most resistance. The then. path of most resistance, because it's going against all those okay, forces. Because that pendulum is pushing you from one to the other. The easy thing to do is just to go, okay, go along for the free ride. Okay. But to experience something different, we've got to jump off that pendulum. That requires effort. It requires going against the forces. It requires breaking free. It requires the willpower, the perseverance, and the practice, which is suffering because it's <laughs> difficult to do. Okay, that's why we call it a voluntary suffering. You have to make the choice, and then we have to fight against it, which is you know, not a necessarily easy thing to do. And until we get the hang of it, it can be it can be complicated at first. Okay, but once we're able to get to that point, then we obtain the reconciliation of the opposites within us. Okay, then every effect the ego tries to make doesn't accomplish anything. Every time the ego introduces a thought in an attempt to get us to identify with it, 
we don't identify. Every time there's an emotion that's generated that gets us to identify with it, we don't go with that either. Think of the thoughts, the emotions as pushes on that swing. Rather than let us get pushed, we're just reconciling that opposite. The eagle's applying a certain amount of force, we're applying an equal and opposite amount of force. Net result, we don't go anywhere. We stay there at that present moment. Imagine sitting on a swing, not going anywhere, that's where you want to be. Somebody walks up and pushes you, imagine you can push back with an equal amount of force, the swing stays motionless at that point in the middle, at that balance point. That's what we're trying to achieve here, the reconciliation of the opposites. The thesis and the antithesis reconciled in the synthesis. Okay, the synthesis being the blend of two, where we recognize the two are in fact one. You've got the heads, you've got the tails, you've just got a coin. Two of the same thing. One is no different from the other, it is two sides of the exact same object. Okay, the pleasure and the pain, two sides of the exact same existence. I prefer one, of, it's silly to prefer one and not the other because it's the same thing. Why would you prefer heads or tails of a coin? It's the same coin, just two different sides of it. Any questions about that? Okay. Yes? Okay, so just be in the now. Be in the now. And that's how you do it. Yeah, to not get caught up in that it's swing. Not that easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not that so, easy. So when you like, it's tough. I, I, work. I work in a factory, so when I start daydream, I go, "Stop it!" I don't think I'm gonna concentrate on something <laughs> for a second, and then it lasts for a couple of seconds, and then I'm thinking about something else. Yeah, it's hard to do. It is. Yeah, it's hard to it's do, but that's hard. the perfect time to practice it. But I'm thinking, okay, every second I do it, the seconds add up. That's yes. what I was thinking. Uh -huh. I like to think of it as every time you do that, every time you don't identify, you stay in the now with your consciousness active. It's like an exercise routine for the consciousness. It's like a workout. And the more you do it, the stronger and stronger it gets. Yeah. So the easier it becomes to do, which means the better you be become at it. And it's like almost like a feedback loop. <laughs> but it takes effort. And <laughs> something like you describe a workout factory, perfect. Because that's you can put so much attention into doing that, and you're probably going to be safer and more productive as well. Because when you're Ironically. daydreaming, everything's foggy, yeah. I notice. And then all of a sudden, I'll just look at something and it'll come clear. Like, yeah. You know? And exactly. I'm like, oh, that looks clear. Like, I've exactly. just been noticing this. I'm playing more yep. tricks with my mind over there. Yeah, no, absolutely. Think of your day. Yeah. And you can think of what did I do today? And if you wrote it down on a piece of paper, you'd have things you can remember and these giant gaping yeah. holes in between. Those giant gaping yeah. holes are when your consciousness is in a really deep state of sleep where you're oblivious mm -hmm. to stuff. And I think about a lot of weird things. It's weird. Everybody does, yeah. I know. And, and depending on what you're doing, me. that's when you have accidents. Yeah. That's when you, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's when right. you get in car accidents. That's when if you're in a factory with machinery, that's when, you know, bad things happen. Because you're literally not aware of your surroundings or what you're doing. You're drifting away and your consciousness has gone to sleep, so you're not aware of what you're doing. Yeah. I find it the same thing like if I'm on a bus, I look outside the window and there I'm gone. Yeah. The minute, you know, I just, yeah. I'm gone. And then I've got this whole fantasy where, you know, going on and go, okay, <laughs> where am I? I always remember that. Okay, just say, tell, tell yourself, I'm on the bus, <laughs> I'm on the Cherry Hill bus, and I'm going to the Y, I'm going Sounds to work like out, me. and, you know, but. And then, hey, then that works for a couple of minutes, and then poof, I'm all I'm gone again. You if know, if you're a, a driver of a vehicle, we've all done this before. You you drive somewhere, yeah. so your destination, you're I like, oh, how did I get here? What happened? I remember getting in the car, and I, I remember getting that intersection, and then yeah. I am suddenly here. Hmm. Like, yeah, what happened in between there? Like, how many people did you run over? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> That's who scary. knows? Yeah, so you do that all the time. You do that all the time. You're yeah. caught up in this. Yeah. Me too. Um, so, so the idea of this lecture essentially uh, is to be content with anything that manifests, knowing they're just manifestations, right? That's one way of putting it. Okay, because, um, like, there for some reason I felt um, a lot of it sounded like oppressing of emotions, but I know that if you oppress emotions, it just results in more. Yeah, emotions. that's that's you can't oppress emotions, and you can't oppress thoughts either. So it's, it's more so that people are trying to oppress the negative emotions and only embrace the positive ones. That's the yeah. idea? Yeah. yeah. People okay. want this but don't want that and it's impossible to have that situation. Um, even Masama has a good quote. There's a difference between, between a mind that is silence and a mind that has been silenced through violence. Like you can't suppress an emotion. You can't suppress a thought. It's not the same thing as 
writing a state where you don't have the thoughts or you don't have the emotions. Right, right, yeah, because it makes a lot more sense to me um, just through my own like experiences yeah. that, that it seems more logical to to kind of embrace whatever it is that comes yeah, it's for what it is the rather car, than the trying to oppress still, it, yeah, the like cars the emotions that arise or something like you that. You can't stop the cars coming down the street, but you don't have to get in and let the cars take you for a ride. Okay, the cars, they're going to drift by, let them drift by, you don't have to identify them. You can't stop them, they're going to happen. Same thing with the, you know, the horses on the carousel. You can jump off the carousel and stop the horses taking you for a ride, but you can't stop the carousel. It's still going to continue, but the difference is it's continuing outside of you. It's not taking you along for the ride. I know uh, the Buddhists um, would call this equanimity. And equanimity, uh, there's exercises they do when you're observing the sensations of the body. They could be pleasant or unpleasant. And when you observe them, you're not reacting because you're observing them and you realize the impermanence of them. Whether it's pleasant, you say, okay, that lasted a few seconds, then it's gone. Or unpleasant, it lasted a minute, then it's gone. And then you're able to then see the impermanence of the different sensations that you're feeling and then you're not, you're gaining wisdom because you're not reacting to them. So you're not, you're, and then you become like a person who's observing the flow of a river. So it's a flow of different sensations that you're having. And you don't want to change them, just like a person looking at a river. You don't want to change, change them. The river, yeah. And then it puts you in a state of objective existence. Yeah. So you're not subjective. You're not That's black right. or white or, yeah. or, or, you're, you're, you're or higher yeah. or lower. Yeah. Yeah. You can observe it better, too, don't you think? You know? yeah, yeah, I think I think that works a lot more. Like <laughs> It sounds more of, of an effective way, because when, when I think to myself, oh, yeah, like I'm lost in my thoughts, let's try to come back, that, that, only, that only works for momentarily instead thinking to yourself, okay, those thoughts will pass, now kind of try to be yeah. more conscious, rather than trying to push yourself to to be conscious, it's just to, um, like, if you're trying, like, for example, with the mind, if you're trying to, it's like, you know, what's next, you know, just wait there for the next thought to arise, rather than saying, no, I shouldn't be thinking, yeah. have a goal for it, you know, if, if it's focused, then like on something and like the key, the you know key what's next that, that's a good that technique that I use is observation yeah it's just observing and that's why <laughs> way back week three week four it was all about self-observation and you can't stress the importance of that enough because if that's what it all comes down to is so what you so what you're saying is, if you're daydreaming, you just let yourself daydream. Well, it's, it's more so I, 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 I'm more so I recognize that it happened, and mm -hmm. then and then I let it pass, and then and then I choose to be more conscious in in like being able to, like you said, observe rather than saying to yourself, no thinking, no don't think, don't think every time you have a thought. It's being observant <laughs> and just recognizing, oh, there's a thought. Don't let it affect me. That type of thing. I, I know the the Buddhists also use an exercise called anapana, and what it is is observing something natural. Just again, just like somebody observing the flow of the river natural. They don't want to change it. One thing that we do have as human beings is a breath, and the sensation of the breath right here. And this is an exercise that Buddha actually taught. So you're breathing normal, and you're observing the sensation, and all of a sudden your mind is boom gone. And then instead of suppressing it, you're saying I'm actually trying to focus on something that is objective, that is natural, which is my breath. I'm going to come back and focus on my breath again. And a few seconds, boom, it's gone. And then you're forcing your, your mind to then observe what you're wanting to do, because you have to tame the mind. If not, the mind is a wild animal, right? Yeah. And through this exercise, you're able to then focus your mind enough to observe natural phenomena objectively without actually you know, suppressing or whatever. You're saying, I realize that my mind is gone, but I have to focus on this. And then after you do that exercise, you're able to then, as you're doing it, if, if you're, you know, like if you're stressed or if you're, you find that you lose the balance of your mind, that's an exercise that brings the balance to the mind again and the focus. And so it's an objective again. The breath is breath. You're not trying to change it. You're not trying to go. You know, no, or it just else. It's just not good. It's breathing not bad. Natural. There's no connotation. Yeah, exactly. It's breathing is. natural, and you're observing something natural, so that slowly starts taming the mind away so it's not driving you, oh, that guy yeah. said this, and he did this, and I should have done this, or whatever. And then two hours later, you're yeah. still angry about it, or replaying yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, sometimes I go for uh, meditation, and it's the Buddhist meditation, and you don't try to do a complete breath or anything. You just breathe naturally, like you breathe, and just notice it. Am I breathing shallow? Is it broken? Is it smooth? And, and just breathe 
and that's all. Hmm. You know, does it feel cool when it's coming in against your nose and just feel it going down? <laughs> yeah. A lot of times you do, hmm. you feel the coolness, it just uh, when you're breathing in, you can feel the coolness on the tip of your nose. <laughs> it's and the, this part here that. helps you focus the mind because it's such a narrow part and your mind becomes sharper and sharper as you do that, right? So you're not wanting to change cool. phenomenon, you're just observing yeah. it. Yeah. And then, you know, it just helps you dealing with other phenomena. Because then uh, other exercises that they do is uh, observing sensations throughout the body. And it might be pleasant or unpleasant, but we're just sensation junkies, right? So we keep reacting like, oh, it feels good, I want more of that. And then your desire comes out, and then you're mixing, you know, you're, yeah. you feel horrible because you're craving something, you know? Because you felt a little sensation for like 10 seconds, and now it's like, Two hours later, I want that car because I want to feel like I'm driving a Jaguar and I'm successful and all this other stuff. And then marketing people chase after that, right? They yeah. want to press your button. Yeah, all because you passed one on the road somewhere. Exactly. Yeah, yeah some fleeting moment. The breath is a good one is because it's something that we do totally unconscious. Mm -hmm. We don't even have to think about it. So when you start focusing on the breath, it trains you to be more aware of the things that you're not aware of. Like we don't think about breathing yet, we do it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many other things that we do like breathing that happens automatically, subconsciously, so many different thoughts and processes that we don't even think about, they just happen. And a, a lot of times they would say that um, the breath is actually what we're calling unconscious, it's actually conscious, it's always conscious. Because uh, you might be sleeping, you might feel something like an insect or something crawling on your hand, and subconsciously, we think, think subconsciously, we smack it, we react to it. So the, the subconscious is in a way always conscious, always like aware of itself, but the you know, so um, the breath is unique in that way because it's something you can do conscious, so you can force a breath, or unconscious. So it's like a bridge between both worlds in a way, you know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool, speaking of practices, got a couple. Yeah. Remember the duality technique? We looked at this way back in the meditation class. It's a, a different uh, meditation technique. The dwelling technique is all about the law of the pendulum. And way back when we looked at the meditation <coughs> class, one of the things I said was, you know, practicing this technique will give you, or might allow you to arrive at a realization about the mind and the, the intellectual process. Really, what I was hinting at was the law of the pendulum. Uh, through the study of the opposites, we arrived at the synthesis. What the dwelling tech is, essentially in a nutshell, is think the opposite of whatever thought comes to your mind. Oh, okay. Okay, because we have this unique way of polarizing things, right? Yeah. So if you think that it's cold in here, imagine that it being warm. If there's a big uh, party coming up this weekend that you're excited <coughs> about, imagine that party being boring, same people, saying the same things, you're probably going to drink too much, <laughs> feel like crap the next day, spend too much money, whatever. For everything that we can think of, we can find a polar opposite to it, if we think hard enough. That's what the duality technique is all about. When the ego introduces a thought like, hey, that party this weekend, that was a push that we that the ego's trying to get us to identify. And then we go, oh yeah, that was gonna be so good, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna do that. Now you're caught in the future, right? The ego's just pushing the future and you're caught in this daydreaming cloud, reliving and planning that party. Yeah. Or if it was the party that happened last weekend, oh remember that party that happened last weekend, oh that was so hard, and then you caught in the past. Yeah. Either way, that thought that was generated has pulled you out of the present moment and taken you somewhere else. With the duality technique, when that thought of the party came up, we think the opposite, which instead has kept us in the present moment. It's like two steps forward, we instead walk two steps backwards. Every thought, every emotion is like us stepping in a direction. It's like the ego pushing us in a certain direction. We have a choice at that point. Do we let the ego keep pushing and run with that thought, or do we instead back up to where we were before the thought came? That's what the duality technique is all about. Just simply arriving in the state, going through the you know, the breathing, relaxing the body, and then just observing the thoughts, observing the <coughs> sensations, and then generating the opposite, whatever comes to mind. If we're worried about, oh, you know, I've got to put that, you know, presentation together at work, it'll be fine, it'll be great, you know what you're doing, you've done your preparation, it'll be fine. So rather than stressing and worrying about what's going to happen and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so simply being aware of the thoughts, and for every thought that manifests, we immediately produce the opposite thought in our mind. Okay, two steps forward, two steps backwards. The ego attempts to shove us one way, we shove back with the same amount of force. Net result, we go nowhere, which means the consciousness stays active and we stay in the present moment with awareness. We don't identify with any of the thoughts. Okay, that's the duality technique. So we're going to do that one. I think we've got a lot of time.
Yeah, we've got about 45 minutes. So we're going to do that one for a while, and after that one, oh, sorry, remembering that every mental form can be eliminated through the synthesis. The thesis and the antithesis are reconciled in the synthesis. That party's going to be really good this weekend, I'm going to have an awesome time. That party's going to be boring and monotonous, I'm going to drink too much. Those are reconciled together in the synthesis, which is, that party is not now, that's the weekend. This is not the weekend. I'll experience that when the moment comes, but right now I'm somewhere else. Okay, the synthesis. Then after that, we'll work on the mantra Gathe Gathe Paragathe Parasangathe Bodhi Swaha because this mantra is for reconciling the opposites. Oh. Now that's on, like if I uh, go online and, and uh, get all that mm -hmm. down, it will be on there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Because mm -hmm. I like to know what the uh, mantras are for. Well, that's, yeah, yeah, it kind of helps, you know. It's kind of a point, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, I knew this one, but I didn't know it was for... Uh, well, because, and because of that, it, it reconciles the op opposites, and once, if you reconcile the opposites, this is the cool part, you reconcile the opposites long enough, if you, if you go, keep trying to push you and you keep pushing back, then the ego gets tired and goes, yeah, forget it. And then you reach the silence of the mind. Mm. The silence of the mind that has been arrived at, not by violence, by trying to suppress every thought. You're letting the thoughts happen. The thoughts are going to happen anyway. You're going to introduce the opposite thoughts. Mm. And eventually you reach a state where the mind is quiet. And with this mantra, you can reach the illuminated void, which is penetrating quite highly. So, you know, Lee, should we do that? Like, say, I'm um, sitting there on the bus and I, poof, take, yep. my mind takes off. Yep. And just say, so just stop and, and just do the opposite of what I was thinking. Say, yep. I'm thinking, oh, it's going to be so great, blah, 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 blah. So you go the opposite. No, it's yeah. going to be the same. And it works the same over. for negative states, too. You can say, oh, yeah. I'm really worried about this. And you can say, well, it doesn't matter. It's not going to happen. Or, yeah. you know, why worry about something that might not happen or whatever. And yeah. just stay yeah. in the moment. So stay on the, stay on the bus. If you're on the bus, stay on the bus. Yeah. Well, my body's there, but my, my brain's somewhere yeah. else. <laughs> my mind's just... Um, I have a question regarding, you, okay, you said um, that the mantra is results in um, experiencing what you call the illuminate void. So let's say you, re you finally reconciled the opposites and now you've achieved the silence of mind mm -hmm. and then something else starts to happen. Mm -hmm. As soon as you recognize that it's happening, it stops happening. Uh, it, would you like... Uh, that's the only oh. way I can really ex say I've experienced. It seems that uh, okay, if your if your whole goal um, is to like reach this illuminated void, mm -hmm. um, and then as soon as you pay attention to it when it happens, it stops happening. Wouldn't wouldn't that be contradictory? It's not, it's not like that though. It's when you reach that state of non-thought. It's not like huh. You're right, I'm thinking nothing. Well, this is right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's true. Because now you're thinking something? It's, okay. It's, a hard, it's hard to describe. It really is one of those kind of difficult to get around. You have to experience it. Because it's not, it sounds like, think, you can't even comprehend what thinking nothing is unless you've been there. But it's not like that kind of, oh, this is really boring, there's nothing there. <laughs> yeah, like, well, exactly. I, I, I know what you mean. Like, that's yeah. why they call it the illuminated boy. It can't really be described in words, mm -hmm. per se, but... Um, I mean, I, but I illuminated void is even beyond like, that point of non-thought. Like, the illuminated okay. void is a really, that's like penetrating deep into the higher dimensions. That's even different from a state of a still mind. That state of non-thought um, remember Emmanuel Kant's quote, the highest, most elevated form of thought is non-thinking. That state is right. not so hard to achieve. That's easy to get to practice. You know what is the whole other thing altogether. That's like the, that's the samadhi, right? That's the mm. ecstasy. That's like the ultimate goal of, of, of a lot of people that meditate is to reach that point. It's like a life-changing experience. But experiencing that state of non-thought is, is not that hard to do with practice. A point where your mind literally turns off, but it's not emptiness either. That's why when people try to describe it, you sound like a retard. You're like, it's everything. But you nothing. nothing. <laughs> yeah. It's darkness. <laughs> light. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, and like I said, uh, <laughs> how do you describe the color orange to a blind man? They don't have the vocabulary, right? You're like, um, uh, the words you try to use, they can't relate to, and you just understand yeah. the weird. It's the same idea. Um, okay. But people always say, well, we know this time we're going to be boring, and like nothing going on. <laughs> it's totally different. Totally different.